Hello and welcome to today's edition of The Listening Lounge. My name is Nick Day and I'm CEO of JGA Recruitment Group and we're specialist payroll and HR recruiters. Now they say the quieter we are, the more we hear and that listening is the secret to discovering the greatest of stories. So sit back, relax and enjoy today's fantastic guest. Today I'm joined by Petra Velzeboer, who is a qualified psychotherapist, global keynote speaker, TEDx speaker, and CEO of PVL. And today's episode's all about mental health strategy in the workplace. We know it's really high up on HR agendas at the moment, and rightly it should be as well. We need a mental health strategy. We need to make sure people can feel comfortable removing those masks and bringing their whole selves to work, if that's the best way to be using. And I would argue it's probably more essential now than ever because it's much more in people's consciousness at the moment. We can do something about it. There are tools, there are experts like yourself helping people. But where do we start? Where's the starting point for creating an HR strategy if we haven't got that backdrop, or we haven't got that experience that you've got there, Petra? It's interesting the stuff you say about masks, because sometimes HR and L&D teams who are tasked with looking after others, they think all of this stuff applies to those others that they're helping, right? And kind of forget that as the HR leaders, it applies to us as well, right? So, so taking that mask off, showing up as who we are actually brings people to, together in a more dynamic way. First of all, many companies are doing something, you know, yeah. they might have a, a, a mental health awareness day initiative, or they might have mental health first aiders, or they may have health and safety reps or whatever it might look like in, in your industry. There, there will be something there. But, but what I still see, you know, broadly across the board is a crisis driven approach. So one that has an employee assistance helpline, we're essentially outsourcing the problem and it's got under the guise of like, well, we're not professionals, we must signpost, you know, over there, they will help them. But if you've been to therapy, you know that a therapist creates a safe space to listen, and yes, occasionally offer some insight or some patterns or, you know, point some things out. But in order for people to feel included in their workplace, we need to be able to have some of these conversations together. Now, I don't just mean, let's all sing kumbaya and have a cry and talk about how depressed we are or the cost of living crisis, right? Of course, that stuff is there and, and we're experiencing it. But if you think about the mental health continuum, which on one end has the crisis struggling kind of side, and in the middle is survival, and on the other side is thriving and excelling. So my question to you as HR leads and, and L&D leads when creating a strategy is, what is the environment we want to create in order to help people thrive? right? And then that language translates to your board as well. So how do we help people perform? That's going to be the language they're going to get, right? And get on board with, right? Sure. And so I would start with dreaming forward. What do we want to be known for? What do we, what kind of talent do we want to attract? Do a little bit of blue sky thinking about like where we want to get to, because so often we get stuck in tactics, which app should we get? I've got this much budget. What's the action plan of things to do? But what we we know is engagement on many tech solutions as well as even webinars and you know the, the the panels or whatever it's dipping right and why is that because the world of work is changing and so we need to be able to zoom out and look ahead to how you know how that is affecting our people truly listen and actually begin the building blocks with that with a bit of a longer run up in mind does that make sense just as, as that no, absolutely like, makes sense you start? I've got neuro things flying all over the place at the minute with that response. I mean, I think um, the first thing that hit me was uh, it was Michael Neal, who's a coach um, that, that I've, I've read some of his material, and he talks about the lamppost metaphor. But actually, just talking to a lamppost for half an hour would do everyone some good. So just yeah. imagine the power of talking to someone who can talk back. You talked a lot about there about the tools and the output thing. I think that sometimes, certainly in the new world of work, we've become in, we've, we've sort of moved into an out an outputs led style of management because people are working remotely. So we're not worried about the, the how we're worried about whether it's been done. And therefore we do sometimes go straight to the, to the response pit, the tools. We miss that really important stuff that you just talked about there, that the, the, the information that, that creates those outputs, but more importantly, thing that really resonated with me is you talked about the EAP uh, mentioned right at the start there, but when it comes to mental health strategy, people tend to go really heavy, really dark, really oh. quickly. And yet when I look at your website and the way that you approach mental health, even despite the backdrop of your story, which, you know, could have resulted in you taking your own life, actually, when it comes to well-being, you seem to be able to do it in a really positive way with a real lightness of touch. So what's, you know, how do we, how do we do that? How do we tackle such a heavy subject in a way that 
gets buy-in and gets has resonance, but isn't so dark. I'm probably influenced by positive psychology, but also with the tactics that have worked for me. So being more solution focused about where I want to get to rather than let's focus on what I don't want to feel. Let's okay. focus on what we do want to feel. So kind of gratitude practices and things like that. Um, Sean Acor, the positive psychologist, has one of the best TED Talks out there. And I believe it's called The Happiness Advantage. But he basically says, so this company is going to, I think he's referring to a school. And so he's like, we're going to do a wellness week. And they're really proud of it. And that so much organization has gone in. It's going to be really exciting. And he says, I'm, I'm going to rephrase. But on Monday, we've got school bullying and violence. On Tuesday, we've got self-harm and depression. You get where I'm going, right? Yeah, and yeah. so every day is like, um, you know, something, they're going to focus on something negative. And he went, that's not a wellness week. That's a sickness week, right? And if we just think about that and apply it to our well-being strategies, are you creating wellness weeks and months and initiatives? Or are you creating sickness weeks where we all focus on what's yeah. so terrible and wrong in the world? And you can tell I can talk about this all day, but um, that, you know, I want to... Um, reposition the conversation again to how do we take personal responsibility for our own mental health to enable us to thrive and i think in this world of output output hybrid working as as you referred to it no longer can the business be as responsible for your well-being yes systems culture has an impact of course but you're you know i got to get up from my desk nobody's watching me i'm not watching if he's having his lunch break at the same time I've got to go to my gym. I've got to eat the right food. You know, I have to recreate habits and take radical responsibility for my life where you just could follow a little bit more beforehand, right? Um, yeah. But I'll also say there's plenty of micromanagement still going on in a hybrid remote world, right? So I don't think everyone's of the mindset is that you are that like, it's about output. It's not about how. It's a, it's a bit messy, I think, in many places yeah. how they're approaching it. Companies are very quick to talk about the positive culture they have in their businesses. And just picking up on what you mentioned there, it's very hard, I think, for any company to say anything about their culture, because if you're a large business, there are micro cultures throughout that that may not actually be what everyone thinks it is. And it's managing, as you say, the, the micro cultures, the, the little things that happen that actually have a bigger impact. What we do know in the world of HR, though, is they've got access to huge realms of data. They're looking at data trends for things that can influence HR strategy. Absolutely. Is there data that we, you know, without making it a cold, hard approach to wellness strategy, but is there data that we can be pulling on that can really help support our wellness or our, our mental health agendas? There is. And that's one of the things we do at PVL is we support right. companies through our well-being strategy program to effectively tell the story of their data. So, um, so there's data coming from all sorts of places, right? Uh, you might have engagement surveys. We've got retention. We've got attrition. We've got uh, engagement. You know, there's a whole range of things. But so often they're still working in silos a little bit. Diversity and inclusion, L&D, HR, culture and engagement, right? And not necessarily really speaking to each other. And then beyond that, now we've got all this data. What the hell do we do with it? Don't communicate communicate effectively to your people the insights that you've taken from it next year they're like well nothing happens with this data anyway like why mm -hmm. would i fill in the survey just to, to to give some of those anecdotal points um so what we've got is not only kind of the the strategy project management tools so you can see everything and prioritize but with our analyst and our head of strategy we help pull together the story of that data and then effectively translate it into a dollar pound amount of savings so your return on investment, what is your return on investment? Because as much as I'm like me and you, you know, and many human resources people, it's like, we're, we've got the human in it, right? So we're like, mm -hmm. we just know it's right. Sometimes it's just the right thing to do. But sometimes these days you need those numbers and data to then go to your board and make it kind of a board level initiative with your, your C-suite, your executives, and just show them that like, hey, when we invest in prevention over here, this is what it's saving you in turnover, presenteeism, the, the whole list of things that you can see in Deloitte reports and, and, and all of that. So data is crucial, but the most crucial thing, if I was to, to just speak from the heart, is uh, developing the skill of bravery. And, and that sounds a bit like out there. You're like, what are you talking about? Like, I do board meetings every day. I'm brave. You know, are you? Um, bravery is showing up and being yourself and asking deep questions, even when you're in a rush or you don't know that you'll know the answer. That's the biggest yeah. one, I think. Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, anything you say you're brave about 
it's not that's not what it's about it's about the things that you can't make that statement to that is where you need to show up i'm a massive fan as well uh, show the kind of things i'm into but um i bought a zoo is a film which i love but in there there's a concept where he says 20 seconds of bravery can change the world and it's just about sometimes just to hold your breath and go for 20 seconds and then see what happens be brave about the things that you're most vulnerable about Get it out when it's out there. Then, then we can see change. Then we can see reaction. And we can see how that's interpreted, and we can work through it. But if you never get it out there, if you never show that vulnerable side, then it's very, very difficult. And what we do know, and all the studies show us, is vulnerability breeds more vulnerability, where other people start to share, and that Connection. shows more empathy. And it's, you know, it's, it comes a snowball effect. Thank you for joining me on today's episode of the Listening Lounge. My name is Nick Day, and remember, every great conversation starts with great listening. Till next time.